discussing his predecessor's response to Russian efforts to meddle in the American election, what Obama knew about it, and why one former administration official says they choked. The latest on this blame game. Air in the air, the frightening moments on board, a jet flu flight forcing an emergency landing. Came down pretty fast. Passengers told to brace for impact. Emergency slides deployed. The search for the cause this morning. Caught on camera. Oh! The lucky boaters in the right place in the right time. I'm standing right here like this filming and I'm like, oh! to catch the moment of a lifetime. Got him! The close encounter they will never forget. Oh. And canine competition, the parade of misfit pups vying for the title of world's ugliest dog. I like how she has hair everywhere-ish. Yeah. Sort of. Who collared the crown? Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Hey, good morning. Uh, a lot of news to get to this morning. And we should point out there are four of us on set this morning instead of uh, five because Ron is over in London on assignment. But we, we miss him, but we will get him later. Uh, as I said, a lot of news this morning. But we want to take a moment to savor the world's ugliest dog competition. <laughs> <laughs> Look at these pooches. We've got three of the top contestants up on your screen right now. Uh, well, it's all, it usually comes down to the tongue, you'll notice, in, in these competitions. <laughs> the tongue? Yeah, the tongue yes. hanging out. It's all, it, the winner often has a weird tongue. Uh, one of these dogs took home the crown. We'll unveil the winner coming up in a few minutes. My favorite beauty pageant of the year. So we can say that your morning's getting off to a great start. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Only way would be better if it was the world's ugliest cat. Oh. See, Dan sees the beauty in the ugly animals, right? And he okay. loves animals. He does. Well, that's straight ahead, but we're going to begin with President Trump now hitting his predecessor. Overnight, Trump criticizing former President Obama on Twitter and on Fox News over his handling of Russian meddling in the U.S. election. Meanwhile, we are entering a key weekend in the battle over health care. This morning, a fifth Republican senator has come out against the latest proposal in the Senate. This latest uh, defector is Nevada's Senator Dean Heller, and he's now being targeted by a pro-Trump super PAC, which in an extraordinary move is going to run critical ads in Heller's home state. Also this morning, a key Senate committee has launched an investigation to former Attorney General Loretta Lynch to see if her actions interfered into the FBI's investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. We're going to kick off our coverage this morning with ABC's David Wright, who's at the White House for us. Good morning, David. Good morning, Paula and Dan. You know, the president's latest comments on Russian hacking would seem to indicate a change in strategy. Having long dismissed the idea that Russia tried to meddle in the November election, President Trump now seems to be taking it seriously and blaming Barack Obama. The first big hint of a shift came late last night in a tweet. Just out, the Obama administration knew far in advance of November 8th about election meddling by Russia. Did nothing about it. Why? The president seems to be reacting to a Washington Post exclusive that offers a much more detailed account of Russian efforts to meddle in the election and President Obama's secret struggle to stop them. Moments after Trump sent out his tweet, Fox News aired a clip from a new interview with the president. I just heard today for the first time that Obama knew about Russia a long time before the election, and he did nothing about it. It's a dramatic shift for a president who earlier this week would not be pinned down on whether he believed the conclusions of U.S. intelligence agencies that Russia did indeed try to meddle. I have not sat down and asked him about a specific reaction to him, so I'd be glad to touch base and get back to you. Trump himself has generally denied the idea. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's just another excuse. The entire thing has been a witch hunt. The Russians did not affect the vote. His new strategy, in light of the Post story, now seems to be blame Obama. Although the Post reports that Obama tried various countermeasures, including confronting Vladimir Putin directly, Obama could have done much more to alert the American public about the threat, according to the Post, which quotes one former Obama official even saying, I feel like we sort of choked. If he had the information, why didn't he do something about it? He should have done something about it. But you don't read that. It's quite sad. 
Now, former Obama officials say there were several reasons they didn't speak out more forcefully at the time. Among other things, they were worried that sounding the alarm might come across as political interference, and they worried that uh, Trump might be a long shot. That's what they, their impression was. Yeah, they thought Trump was a long shot. Sounds like they underestimated him. Okay, so the Senate this week released a draft of its health care bill, David. There is room for negotiation, but as is, how much Republican opposition is there? Well, as you noted at the top of the show, overnight another Senate Republican, Dean Heller of Nevada, came out against the bill. He's the fifth Republican senator to do so. The Republicans have only a razor-thin majority in the Senate to begin with, just barely enough, enough votes to pass this thing. So unless they can win over some of those defectors, this bill would seem to be dead on arrival. There is still some room to tweak some of the language, and that may change some of the vote tallies. But, David, thank you very much. We'll continue to cover this story. Of course, we do want to bring in now ABC News political analyst Kristen Soltis Anderson, who's also in Washington this morning. Kristen, good morning. Uh, let me ask you first about President Trump's strategy of blaming his predecessor for not doing more about Russian meddling. Smart play, in your view? I think certainly it's a smart play because more and more evidence is coming out suggesting that, yes, Russia did, in fact, attempt to influence our elections. Uh, this is clearer and clearer. And so pivoting instead from diminishing this idea to instead saying, well, why didn't anybody do anything about it still allows Trump to push the blame somewhere else and to say, look, my win was still legitimate. If folks had really had a problem with this, why did they only wait until after I won the election to make a big deal about it? This is really the heart of why so many Republicans and Democrats have such widely differing views on this. Because when the argument is, well, did Russia interfere in the election, for Trump and a lot of his supporters, that sounds like you're alleging that vote totals were changed, voting machines were hacked. What what this story is suggesting instead is that Russia tried to change the news around the election, affect the campaign narrative, and it was when Obama finally told Putin, hey, you need to knock it off, that he backed away and did not attempt to change any voting machines. So now the narrative does support the idea that, yes, Trump won the election legitimately, but that also Russia did really try to play a role. It is an interesting part of the narrative. I want to go back to health care. We know that the Republicans need a simple majority to get this passed in the Senate, but how much of an uphill battle do Republicans face in passing this bill? It's going to be a big uphill battle, and that's in part because of the makeup of the Senate and the fact that you have both a handful of moderate members, folks who are up for re-election in tough <coughs> states, uh, folks who are going to be on the ballot whose states uh, they worry may be negatively impacted by this bill, and conservative members who think this bill doesn't go far enough in living up to the Republican promise that they would repeal and replace Obamacare. So on the, on the right-hand side, you have folks like Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, really conservative Tea Party senators who don't think this goes far enough. Any changes to the bill to make them happier might risk losing even more senators on the moderate side. So it's a very tight, tight rope that uh, Senate leadership has to walk in order to get this bill passed. Yeah, really tough titration. Kristen Soltis Anderson, who we call sometimes KSA, and you knew it was coming. Thank you, KSA. We really appreciate it. Thanks for <laughs> Thank joining us on, on a Saturday morning. We do have some good news out of Washington this morning. Representative Steve Scalise who was shot during a congressional baseball practice more than a week ago. He has now been upgraded to fair condition, we're happy to report. Scalise, who is one of the highest ranking Republicans in the House, is out of the intensive care unit and beginning rehabilitation. And Matt Micah, a lobbyist who was also shot during that attack, was released from the hospital on Friday. And in other news, in Saudi Arabia, raids this morning after police foil a terror attack on Islam's holiest site. A suicide bomber blew himself up near the Grand Mosque in Mecca overnight after being surrounded by police. That blast demolished a building. It killed the bomber and injured at least 10 others. The plot to target the Grand Mosque comes as the fasting month of Ramadan comes to an end this weekend, actually, this evening, in fact. We want to talk more about this, so let's bring in ABC News contributor Steve Ganyard, a retired Marine Corps colonel who also served at the State Department. Steve is also joining us from Washington this morning. Steve, good morning. I think, I think a lot of people may wonder, why would terrorists uh, attack a Muslim holy site if the, these terrorists themselves are Islamic fundamentalists? Um, that's a good question, Dan. Uh, right now, we don't know what kind of terrorists these were. So they could have been uh, Shia terrorists backed by Iran, uh, but they also could have been Sunni terrorists. There was a lot of upheaval this week with the announcement of a new secession plan, uh, a new uh, king to be named uh, who will have a, a mandate to really change the culture of Saudi Arabia because of the drop in the price of oil. So there's a lot of turmoil, internal social turmoil going on in Saudi Arabia, but also that continuing struggle between Sunni and Shia Islam.
Yeah, it could be some political motivation there. Uh, we've also seen an uptick of ISIS-inspired attacks recently in the UK, but they're losing ground elsewhere. If this attack in Mecca was indeed ISIS, do you think it's a sign of desperation? It certainly is. I mean, Paul, you think about it right now, the fight that's going on out in eastern Syria is, is Shia and Sunni Islam uh, coming together to squeeze uh, IS. And it may be the demise of IS, but this is really just the end of the beginning. So uh, this, this greater battle between Shia and Sunni Islam uh, will continue, and the West will feel it in, this, in the uh, frag pattern as the, uh, as the terrorists seek to, uh, to hit out at, uh, at either side of Islam. All right, Steve Ganyard joining us from Washington. Thanks for your analysis Thanks, and insight, Steve. Uh, also in London, hundreds of families evacuated from more than 600 apartments because of safety concerns following last week's devastating high-rise fire that killed 79 people. The five evacuated high-rise buildings considered a risk after they failed safety tests triggered by the fire. Reports this morning that 27 buildings in the UK have failed recent fire cladding tests. Not the results you want. No. Back here at home, some dicey moments during the start of the busy travel season. Smoke started to fill a jet blue flight, forcing an emergency landing in Charleston, South Carolina. Our Eva Pilgrim joins us with more on exactly what happened. Good morning to you, Eva. Good morning. This morning, a three-hour flight interrupted. A plane forced out of the sky. Everyone on board rushing to safety. Scary moments mid-flight. A JetBlue plane forced to make an emergency landing smoke spotted inside the plane. F-13, just heads up. We will stop on the runway and plan an evacuation. Passengers evacuating. First responders on the scene. We went over the bracing position. Came down pretty fast. Flight 913 took off Friday morning from White Plains, New York, en route to Fort Lauderdale. Halfway through the flight, passengers and crew noticed a problem. People started um, smelling smoke and there was obviously a little bit of haze in the air. The plane forced to land in Charleston, South Carolina, hundreds of miles away from its intended final destination. We did have a smoke event in the cockpit or in the cabin and uh, they've gone out, but it still smells back there. Passengers telling ABC News the crew warning them to brace for impact. All 98 passengers and four crew members on board evacuating down the slides. Emergency crews meeting them on the runway. No one was hurt. A few people, I'm sure, were praying uh, and thinking that was it, but never felt like it was out of control. Well, JetBlue sent a new plane to pick up those passengers and take them to Florida last night. The FAA is investigating the cause of that smoke. Eva, thank you. Another Thanks quick uh, aviation note out of Ohio. The Thunderbirds have canceled this afternoon's performance at the Dayton Air Show after a scare there. Investigators are trying to find out what caused an F-16 to flip over, overturning on the taxiway Friday. After landing at Dayton International Airport, the pilot and a passenger uh, was on a ride-along, were taken to the hospital where they are said to be in good condition this morning. So that's good to hear. At least they're in good condition after that scary incident. There's been another mistrial in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the case of a former police officer accused of murder in the shooting of an unarmed driver. Jurors telling the judge they were unable to reach a verdict yet again. This was the second trial for Officer Ray Tensing. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez is in Los Angeles with much more on this story. Marcy, good morning to you. Dan Paula, good morning. The jury deliberated for 30 hours over five days, but the outcome was the same as the first trial. The family of the man he killed reacting, calling it unjust. This morning, anger and frustration over that courtroom deja vu. We are outraged. For the second time, a mistrial declared in the case against former University of Cincinnati police officer Ray Tensing. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you sent a note out that says we are almost evenly split regarding our votes toward a final verdict. The jury deadlocked on whether or not Tensing should be convicted on murder and voluntary manslaughter charges in the shooting death of Sam DuBose during this traffic stop in 2015. You have a license on you. I have a license. Tensing repeatedly asking okay. for DuBose's driver's license. The situation escalating quickly. Go and take your seatbelt off. Tensing then shoots DuBose, testifying that he feared for his life. DuBose was unarmed. I could just see his, his head, and that's just when I reached up as far as I could with my right hand and, and fired a shot. This is the third trial in a week against a law enforcement officer accused of killing a suspect to end without a conviction. 
Seven days earlier, Minnesota police officer Geronimo Yanez was acquitted of fatally shooting Philando Castile after pulling him over during a traffic stop. And on Wednesday, former Milwaukee police officer Dominique Hagen Brown was found not guilty in the shooting death of Silville Smith during a foot chase. Once jurors have this perception that officers may be in fear of their lives, even given poor tactics, because the officers takes these risks uh, to protect all of us, it, it's going to be very difficult to get these guilty verdicts. Now asking that the case be tried for a third time, the lead prosecutor says he won't comment on his plans until next week. Dan? Marcy, thank you very much. Marcy Gonzalez reporting from Los Angeles. In Las Vegas this morning, the father of a boy from California missing since April is now under arrest. He is suspected in the child's murder. Uh, Armazad Andresian Sr. is expected to be extradited to Los Angeles. Police are not saying what led to the arrest. The five-year-old was with his dad when he disappeared. And it is time now for the weather and Rob Marciano and uh, remnants of Cindy. Mm -hmm. Still out there, but Cindy kind of foiled your vacation. Well, I took too, a couple right? days off to spend time with uh, my uncle uh, to play some golf, and Cindy actually got to Ohio where they saw some heavy rain yesterday, spoiling the last day of that. But uh, it also spoiled some folks in uh, western Pennsylvania. Look at this. This is out of Washington County. All part of what's left over, Cindy, plus a cold front squeezing it out. Three reported tornadoes there. Also, about five, six inches of rainfall falling just east of Pittsburgh, but the heaviest rain down across Alabama. This traumatic stuff out of Muscle Shoals yesterday. You may have seen it late last night. These folks scrambling to get people out of this car that was submerged in water and the water was rising. A human chain just to hold everybody together and get these folks out of there. Over a foot of rain falling in many spots and the ground is saturated there. The thunderstorms from the northern part of this system now getting to New Jersey. A couple of spin-ups as far as the tornadoes, tornado warnings there. So that'll roll off towards the east, but the heaviest rains will be down across the south, south of Dallas, or north of Houston. This ground is saturated from all the rains earlier, so it's only going to take one or two inches more to m cause some flooding, and we probably will get that as the front drapes and drifts down towards the Gulf of Mexico. That actually is pretty rare for this time of year. And timing this out, we'll get it out of here about 9, 10 o'clock, and drier air moves in for a pretty nice weekend across the northeast. They will take it after the storms this morning. That is a quick check on what's going on nationally. Let's now take a look at your local forecast. Showers pushing off to the east, giving way to mostly sunny skies for the rest of this weekend. A look at temperatures right now, upper 60s to low 70s across the board, and we will be heating up very nicely into this afternoon. So if you're heading out to the Alexandria Food and Wine Fest today, bright blue skies and our temperatures in the upper 80s to low 90s. Also, a very nice afternoon coming up on Sunday, less humid and our daytime highs in the mid 80s. Enjoy the weekend. Coming up in the next half, it's the beach forecast for our friends in the West Coast. We didn't forget about you. It's going to be smoking hot out there. Bump, and folks set. are going to want to be. It's going to be like a It's going to be like 120 in Phoenix, right? Yeah, it's been hot all week, but uh, even oh, in the Northwest, <laughs> that was yours. 100 degrees. <clears throat> yes, I've Ron, we missed you, but I got to say, it's pretty comfortable it's nice here. To I sit, might right? take a little snooze. This is nice. You like to share? Because oh. normally you're standing. Yeah. I bet so we can see your nice socks. Yeah, Thank I feel bad. You got sock game. Thank you. Rob's the only one that has to stand. We all get a nice chair. He's but complained maybe. about it before. Off <laughs> I've heard about it. Squeaky wheel, squeaky wheel. Maybe I'll get a high chair next to Rob. <laughs> I like it. Uh, all right, we're going to turn now to what is, uh, for my money, as I said at the top of the show, the best beauty pageant ever. It's the world's ugliest dog competition. Look your, at that. See, there's the tongue. But for your money? Are you putting money down on this? I did not bet on this. Yeah. At least that I'm willing to admit publicly. <laughs> All right, well, Adrian's covering the canine competition for us this morning. It is about the tongue. And, and the underbite, severe uh, underbite on yes. some of these dogs. Yes, we head to my home state of California, Petaluma, and the Sonoma Marin Fair. The contest has drawn thousands of people every year since the 70s. The dog days of summer are here, and last night was no exception for the world's ugliest dog competition. With a permanent frown due to that sexy overbite. Pooches parading, thrilling crowds, and rewarded for their rough appearance, donning some crazy outfits and even pearls. I like how she has hair everywhere-ish. Yeah. Sort of. 14 of what judges call the most hideous hounds taking to the stage, all vying for the most beastly title. And our winner of the world's ugliest dog, 2017. Every dog has its day, 
but the biggest proving to be the ugliest. 125-pound Neapolitan Mastiff, Martha.